Good afternoon, Sunny Bonani, Dumalang, Puyumeda, and a hearty good afternoon to our colleagues and friends who's online as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kim Wright, Ms. Nicole Coffey Babas, Mr. Tony Zeller, Mr. Philip George, colleagues, friends, and students. My name is Rizal Domingo. I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Johannesburg. And on behalf of the faculty, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our hybrid public lecture on integrative law. Now, a lot of people, when we advertise this, I got a few calls, exactly what is integrative law? Are you going to do meditation and have crystals and all sorts of things? So I think sometimes that is the perceptions or misconceptions around integrative law. So I truly look forward to today's um, a discussion. As you know, we, we teach um, our law students to work in a framework of an adversarial system. And so, colleagues, I do ask you to keep an open mind around what integrative law means, particularly in the context of South Africa and with our value systems of Ubuntu. And so, without much further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Michelle. But before I do that, Michelle is going to do the closing. And so in that closing, she's not going to, she's going to give a thanks to everyone, but I know she's not going to say thank you to herself. So Michelle, on behalf of the faculty and myself in particular, thank you for putting all of this together and to the marketing team that supported you. I am truly grateful for that as well. And so Michelle, I, as program director, I'm now going to hand over to you. That's going to do the formal introductions. Thank you. Um, and thank you for, for opening the event and a very warm welcome to all of our colleagues, our students, as well as our honoured guests uh, that have joined us at the ABK Library, as well as a warm welcome to our online colleagues and students that have joined us virtually on Zoom. Now, perhaps I should start and just, and, and the Dean has briefly mentioned this, but I'd like to start and, and just mention that this event would not be possible if it wasn't for the support of the many colleagues that uh, really work tirelessly behind the scenes. And maybe I can just mention a few. Uh, of course, the support of the Dean and the law faculty, our sponsors, LexisNexis, as well as the UJ Law Library that's really uh, provided us with a wonderful venue and the online Zoom platform. And not to forget our marketing team, Ms. Kutza Kukane, for, for her support. Um, let's not forget about our honored guests, and this is really what, what today's uh, public lecture is about. And a very warm welcome to each of you. Um, today's public lecture will be on integrative law, and perhaps I can just introduce some uh, uh, our, our guests. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Kim Wright. Uh, who's arguably one of the central figures on integrative law and the integrative law movement. Uh, she's a senior fellow at the Project for Integrative Law and Legal Education um, Center on Dispute Resolution in Quinnipiac University, of, uh, University School of Law in Connecticut in the United States, where she also teaches remote courses on integrative law approaches to negotiation. She's also the author of two uh, American Bar Association uh, books and also the contributor to various other books and book projects. She's been a lawyer since 1989 and her law practice has explored areas such as forms of value-based mediation, um, uh, alternative dispute resolution, holistic law, therapeutic jurisprudence, um, and, and things that are also quite close to my heart uh, such as plain language and humanizing legal education, uh, and not to forget the conscious contract approach. Now, in 20, 2008, uh, Kim gave up her law practice, and since then she's lectured at a dozen law schools across six continents. So she's she's been uh, engaging on this uh, in quite a quite a broad sphere. She leads a team of change makers through her company, Cutting Edge Legal Enterprises Incorporated. And our current projects includes the finalization of, of quite a few books 
some of which are, for example, trauma-informed law, uh, the legal design collaboration, and also some, some projects in, in countries like South Africa, Zambia, Brazil, Australia, and the United, uh, the EU. Welcome. Thank you. Um, our second panelist, uh, Nicole Coping Pavas, uh, is a transformed uh, transformative uh, lawyer. She became a lawyer in southern, uh, southern Africa in 1996 and in 2008 established herself as a lawyer and a mediator in Canada. She has also been in mediation and mindfulness uh, practitioner since 2009, and she has been traveling the world in. Uh, spreading that message and also uh, growing herself. So, so welcome. Our, our third panelist is uh, Tony Zell, and he started his birth law career after 30 years in private practice. He led the board of Earth Law Center from 2018 to 2021 and now serves as the Earth Law Center's general counsel. He's also the chair and president of the Earth Law Center. Uh, he's the lead editor and author of the 2021 book, Earth Law Emerging Ecocentric Law, A Guide for Practitioners, and has spoken at several conferences in, in areas such as uh, Uni uh, University of Wisconsin, Law School, Vermont, Journal of Environmental Law, as well as conferences in Australia and Asia. Welcome. And then our final panelist, Philip uh, Daunt, uh, he is a business and real estate attorney and mediator who applies coaching approaches in terms of the law and also works in collaborative, uh, collaboratively with, with clients. Uh, he specializes in areas such as real estate, uh, short sales, business and, and real estate planning, uh, transactional advice, negotiation, mediation, litigation and conflict. Resolution. Welcome. And perhaps I can then just ask Kim to start the conversation with a, a general overview of what integrated law is, and then I'll ask um, Nicole, Tony, and Philip just to provide some practical insights on the experiences of integrated law, specifically in the fields of business, labor, um, family law, and environment. Thank you very much. Kim. While we're getting the slideshow set up, I want to introduce you to the integrative law elephant. And the integrative law elephant is, is sort of a mascot. And it is uh, based on the story that some of you may know. There's this legend of six blind men encountering an elephant. And each person who touches the elephants um, encounters a different part. So one man touches the back of the elephant and he says, oh, an elephant is like a wall. One touches the leg and says the elephant is like a tree. One man touches the trunk and says, oh no, a snake, a fan, a sword, a rope. And they argue about the elephant. Now, integrative law is like that. Some people encounter one part of integrative law and they think that is the whole thing. So perhaps they find something like an alternative dispute resolution and they say, oh, this is it. Maybe some of them do find mindfulness and they say, that's it too. But, they, but then they argue about what is integrative law. So I, want, I, I have this here as a way for you to, um, to keep in mind that all of the things I'm gonna talk about and all of the things the panelists are gonna talk about are part of integrative law. And my overview is about really what is it that kind of holds it together and, um, and then an overview of some of the pieces of it. So there's no question that in, in the world right now, am I in a good place for the camera? Um, in the world right now, we have a lot of what the systems change people call wicked problems. We have climate change, the pandemic, political unrest, and the, uh, what, they're, um, what the systems change people are saying is that we're in a time of cataclysmic change and that our systems are disintegrating. And it's a time where we need leaders. And where do we find leaders? Well, actually, when the world needs a leader, they turn to lawyers. 
Lawyers are the politicians. They're the people we, um, that uh, they go to for problems. And so we're at a time when uh, it's more important than ever for lawyers to be leaders. And leaders need to have more knowledge than just the, um, the strict legal knowledge. So integrative law is starting to bring in other ways of knowing. So this is, um, for those of you, of you on Zoom, um, just listen up. We're gonna talk a little bit about a paradigm shift and I'm gonna uh, ask those of you who are present to help me with this. There's an image up there. It's in black and white over to the left. Um, and what do you see? Yes. Uh, I see an old woman uh, oh. crouching. An old woman crouching. Yes. And um, and does anybody see something else? Yes. It's a young woman looking on the side, but those are the dichotomies of life. <laughs> a young woman. <laughs> you see an old woman, and you see a young woman, and 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 you also see that there's another another possibility. Yes. I see a vision of an African map. Oh, oh, I haven't yeah. seen that one before. <laughs> so when we look at this picture, we can, we can see one thing or the other, and that's how a paradigm shift works. You are trained in the adversarial system. That is a paradigm. The non-adversarial system is a different paradigm. And when we look at these pictures, we see um, we can see both. Can can everybody see both the young and the old woman? Yes. You can? Yes. No, I don't think everybody can. So another thing about paradigm shifts is sometimes we have to help each other. With somebody who sees the old woman and not the young woman, raise their hand. Okay. Somebody help her see both of them. We're gonna we're gonna use you as the example. Maybe you in front of her, help, help to explain to her, okay. Okay, so if you look at the, the side jaw, it's a, of a young female, and then uh, from the neck, it's, that's when you see a grandma, but also with the, how the visuals are appearing, it can also be a apparent reality or a real reality of how we perceive those uh, two aspects of uh, dichotomy in the paradigm shift. Did that help you? Do you see the both of them? No, I don't think. <laughs> 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 so if you look at the, can you see the, um, the, the young woman? Yeah. Which one can you see the young woman, right? If you look at the chin of the young woman, it's actually the nose of the old woman. Oh! So if you see the nose, it's actually the nose. And then she's holding something like a bracelet. The bracelet is actually the mouth of the old woman. Yeah! And you see it now? And her ears are the eyes. Yeah. The other black is my one. Maybe that one's easier. Yeah, no one. The other one. What do you see? The other black and white. Yes. I see a bunny as well as a duck. A, a bunny duck and a duck. Yeah. So how can you see both at the same time? I just change my, I don't know, <laughs> the way I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One more, very quickly. This other one, the brown one, what do you see? A frog. Everybody sees the frog? Yeah. Who sees the horse? Horse. You see the horse? Tell us how you see the horse. It's like you're hitting the horse from my side, but looking at it, you can see actually the nose. But the nose, 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 the nose. If you turn your head, you can see a horse. It's a horse's head. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be asking you to be looking at what I'm offering with that same kind of curiosity. So integrative law has actually been around for a while. It went by many different names. Um, uh, things like restorative justice and collaborative law are part of this movement. And um, there are four components uh, that are part of it. And I'm just gonna go quickly. Uh, I, I wrote a book and did some research on 
um, on the integrative lawyers of the world and, and what they had in common. And so one is that they are very often reflective. And the reflective part can be um, through mindfulness, meditation, contemplative, contemplative practices, or it can also be a sort of personal growth and things like that. They're also values-based. Their values are very important to them. So for example, the Dean mentions Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a cultural value that if you are basing your life and your law practice on Ubuntu, your values are gonna be giving you a different way of being. There's a systems thinking piece where we're looking at how things are interconnected. And then a consciousness piece, which often shows up as non-duality or this, uh, again, a sense of interconnectedness and, and, and a, a different way of thinking. And those lead to um, this inquiry about how can I practice law? How can I be a lawyer and still be myself if these are the things that are important to me? So here, the, uh, this image, um, I call the integrative law garden, and it helps to explain uh, what I believe has been happening. So this paradigm shift has been happening in the world. And the values that are here in the soil are the values that um, come from integrative law. So the, this, again, is part of the research I did. What are the values that integrative lawyers have? And so some of them are things like dignity, being relational, humanizing the stakeholders in the system, um, seeking happiness, being inclusive, compassion, embracing challenges. So, um, so this is sort of the soil that has, that has given rise to a lot of different ways of practicing law. So one of the, um, uh, one of the things might be alternative dispute resolution, for example. I, I like to think of the big tree as alternative dispute resolution because it's been around for a while and there are lots of little branches and leaves of things that you would call ADR. Um, and, and I'm gonna talk about some of the other things that have emerged. So restorative justice, the South Africa has led the world in, in restorative justice. Um, the TRC showed the rest of the world that it could be done in, um, in the most difficult uh, situations. And uh, I'm just you're gonna see every one I offer is gonna give you the South African ex uh, experience. Um, this is Sheena Yonker. She does restorative justice, she's in Durban. The divorce and family law has changed because of this uh, the soil and the, the values that have been shifting over time and things like collaborative law and mediation, starting to look at like maybe we lawyers don't know everything and we need to have some help from the psychologists and the financial professionals and other disciplines as we're going through family uh, situations, taking a more holistic approach that's client-centered and uh, meets the needs of children. So again, South Africa is one of the leaders in looking out for children in the legal system. Here are a couple of people who, um, Deborah Segrat in um, and, uh, Cape Town is doing collaborative and uh, Lane Lanky, um, in uh, Pretoria is, is, is I, I met her the other day and she was telling me how she was starting to see that she needed to work with a psychologist in doing um, parenting. Yeah, she mentioned that she knows. And parenting plants, that, uh, that it's not just a legal issue. We need help from others. Holistic law, which covers a, a lot of different things, uh, was actually in 1998, um, Elsa Olkers uh, brought holistic law um, to uh, South Africa for the first time. She's also an organizational consultant, which is another sort of interdisciplinary uh, role. Earth jurisprudence. Now there's this, um, and, and Tony's gonna to talk more about this. Uh, there's this whole movement around the world of starting to look at how, what is our relationship to mother earth? And how do we plan for future generations? And this, um, this image here, is of a river in, uh, I think it's New Zealand. Sorry, I just went blank for a minute. New Zealand that has been declared a legal person. If corporations can be people, why not rivers? They touch so many people. And so then there's a council um, of indigenous leaders and others who oversee the river so that, for example, if you are a neighbor of the river, you can't just dump 
uh, uh, refuse into the river and destroy the river, um, you, you're responsible to a bigger community, even if it's adjoining your land. And where did we get this earth jurisprudence? Well, one of the people is Cormac Cullinan, who practices in Cape Town. He wrote a book called Wild Law. And Tony can talk to you about um, how that book changed his life. Contracts are changing drastically. And this is an example of a contract in Australia. A piece of a contract. It's um, a company called Aracon. They have 7,000 employees. This is a piece of their contract. It's a comic contract. So that um, instead of thousands of words in a document, they have images um, and mixed with words. We actually had this looked at, um, uh, I was at a conference a couple of years ago and the uh, Chief Justice of Australia had retired the week before. And well, we had him come and give us a legal opinion at the conference. And he said, you know, uh, this, this is as open to interpretation as words and in some ways it's clear. So these are legally enforceable contracts. I like, by the way, these are the values of the company. And my favorite one is being playful with serious intent. Where did those come from? Robert DeRoy in Cape Town actually invented comic contracts. And uh, uh, he's been recognized by uh, Harvard Business Review, the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Fortune Magazine, and by um, a 2016 award by the, uh, what's now called the World Commerce um, World Commerce Center. I, anyway, World Commerce and Contract, and he was another C, um, which uh, is an international organization of contracts. This is an example of one of his contracts. What, what could go wrong and how to fix it. Um, they've done a lot of um, research. The West, uh, Western um, Australia University does a lot of research about these and they've actually found that they're more effective for everybody. But when Robert created them, he was concerned about literacy and the difference in languages. And for Robert, it's about dignity. This is the first one he did. I don't know if he knows that I'm still showing this, but uh, uh, the very first one he did was for domestic workers. And, um, and he, he was concerned about that, the dignity to be able to uh, understand a contract. You've heard about yoga. To, um, and mindfulness, and, and you're laughing about it. This is a uh, book by the American Bar Association. And this is a, uh, a lawyer in uh, Durban who actually has a yoga center. I'm not laughing, I'm impressed, actually. Okay. <laughs> well, good. Mindfulness is also part of this movement. We have uh, one of the uh, uh, prominent mindfulness instructor for lawyers here with us, uh, originally from Johannesburg and now living in Canada. Uh, but also in Cape Town, Ginny Canal teaches mindfulness to lawyers. Plain language, you mentioned plain language. Uh, international movement, I learned plain language in the 80s in law school. And for some reason, it's still not the mainstream, but one of the world leaders is Elizabeth de Stadler and Cape Town. She also does what's called fun law. And she has a, 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 a I think it's monthly webinar. If you want to uh, look for her, uh, she, uh, she's uh, trying to make law more fun in general. The conscious contracts process, is, I'm one of the co-creators of that. But if you go to our website and listen to the video, you'll hear a South African accent um, uh, actually explaining the conscious contracts process. And it's, uh, it's a model that uh, is very different than what we mostly do with contracts. You know, it's a form, you pull it out, you make a little change here, you fill it out, and that's a contract. These are actually very, very personalized. That a conscious contract starts with a conversation about who are you and why do you want to do this? What's your vision for the world? What is it that um, uh, made you choose this person? And, um, and, and how do you want to work together? 
And then you actually create a conflict resolution system that's based on those values and that system. So um, if you, uh, this diagram has too much to, to read, but it, it's, you can find it on the um, consciouscontracts.com site. And one of our prominent members who's done this um, conscious contracts work internationally, one of the first people to be certified in conscious contracts is Rhiannon Thomas, who's also a multidisciplinary uh, practitioner. She works with, she does um, anti-nuptials um, and she does um, contracts with businesses using the conscious contracts method. She also uh, uh, does something really interesting with, uh, with wills. She actually has uh, a relationship with someone who is um, an expert on death and dying. And, um, and she brings them in to help talk to people about what is their legacy and what is it that, um, like, what are they afraid of? And um, it helps them come to peace with the idea that someday they won't be around so that they can be more effective in their wills. So there's a lot of different evolving roles. Um, sometimes I talk about it as building bridges. Um, my book was, uh, first book was called Lawyers as Peacemakers. I'm a legal change maker. And, I, and lawyers as designers, uh, it's like the idea that we could actually be designing for the future rather than trying to look back to the past. Oops, wrong way. Um, I'm mentioning um, Philip here. He, uh, I, I don't think we have anybody in South Africa who's doing this approach yet, but we're going to find somebody. Um, he does the coach approach to lawyering. So he teaches content clients how to transform legal problems into opportunities um, for positive change. So I've talked about a lot of different things. This is another way of looking at it. It's like through, um, this image shows you analytical thinking and substantive legal knowledge are extremely important. I am never going to say that what we learn in substantive law and, uh, and how to think like a lawyer that, that I will never say those are not important. I think they are critical, but it's also really important to be a broader person. And so these, these are topics that show up in the integrative law movement. There are people who are working on every one of these. There, uh, there's knowledge, intrapersonal relationships, or relational practices, transpersonal and systemic. So lots and lots of different, different topics and things that like, you know, I mentioned Rihanna, if you are doing wills and you're not talking to people about what it means to die, then uh, you are not actually serving them as, as fully as you could be um, serving them. I'm going to show you a few South Africans. Um, so, uh, some of you may have encountered um, Prof. John Ferris, who retired from UNISA. He was the director of the Institute for Dis uh, African Dispute Resolution. And uh, when I met Prof. Ferris, he actually came to an event at UNISA, something like this, to introduce me, but he, we'd never met. And he, and he, he said something, not as lateness, as, he said something like, what could this American actually have to tell us? <laughs> and, um, um, but, but she's here. So let's, uh, let's go forward. And, um, and when I finished, he said, you're talking about African dispute resolution. This is about dignity. This is about connectedness, that interconnectedness is part of the law and, um, and that our humanity is part of the law. And in um, 2015, he actually put on a conference at UNISA. Um, many prominent people came uh, and, uh, um, and it was called the Lawyers as Peacemakers Conference. Um, uh, some other things, just to let you know, I, you know, trained legal aid. I'm working with uh, uh, Ivan Skalula from UCT, retired professor emeritus. Um, actually, we're working in uh, Zambia. Uh, I've trained in collaborative law. Um, Amanda Lamont, who some of you may know, um, was the first person to invite me to South Africa. And uh, there are a lot of people around South Africa now who, you know, you notice all the things I was talking about going on in South Africa. We actually are somewhat of a community now. And then I've also uh, recently been to Varsity College and uh, Johannesburg, um, to UWC 
and to uh, Varsity College in Durban and Cape Town. And in case, you, in case you're not doing anything next week, uh, we have an upcoming retreat um, in Cape Town that is, um, that is bringing together a lot of these people to really look at what this integrated law mean in the South African context. Um, this, is, uh, this gentleman's been teaching a module in integrative law. Um, and, uh, and he says that integrative law is an experience against the view that as human beings, we're not separate from the legal system that are part of its very existence. There's, uh, we have a podcast um, that um, is Integrative Lawyers of the World and uh, a free podcast. And we do, because this is a worldwide movement, we do one person from each continent in every series. And so there, uh, there have been three, uh, three series so far. We have three Africans, three Australians, three North Americans, et cetera. And uh, if you want to know more about this movement, you can actually visit that podcast site and, and just pick out somebody that we're all really different, but we're all still part of the same elephant of you know, coming from that values-based approach, being reflective, changing the system, and, uh, and bringing a, being arbingers of a new consciousness in the law. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking your Friday afternoon off to be here. Uh, I have to apologize to Michelle. She <coughs> asked me to send her a bio. <coughs> and I'm not great with bios. I, I'd rather you see me and then decide if you like me rather than read where I'm on a piece of paper. But she did ask me to send it to her uh, and I didn't respond and then she said, this is what I've got. And I couldn't respond because I was actually hosting the first ever mindfulness retreat for lawyers, for international lawyers on safari. There wasn't much Wi-Fi. Quite frankly, the riders and the elephants were more excited than my my bio. So, <laughs> whatever you cobbled together, thank you, thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. It does say in my bio, I'm a mindfulness practitioner since 2009. That's when I started my mindfulness journey. But I'm actually a trained instructor for mindfulness and law through um, the uh, Berkeley University. I also furthered my mindfulness training by spending two weeks with the monks up in Northern Thailand in the forest region. So um, for me, it was really about bringing mindfulness into the law and how can we bring this content practices? Because usually what law societies do and uh, bar associations do is they recognize that there's a problem. But the problem is by the time a lawyer has got to that problem, it's too late. Because by the time they are either addicted to drugs or they are suicidal or they are an alcoholic, there's not much we can do for them. And so why aren't we bringing in preventative measures from the day people start law school? Because law school is very, very, it's very, very hard. And um, law schools train us to be competitive, perfectionists, cynical, um, all those lovely words. And then we come home and our family can't understand why we are so miserable because we can't just turn the light off when we leave our office and then just be happy and all okay. So really our career impedes so much, so many areas of our lives and our families very often are the ones that bear the brunt of our stress and yes, I'll say it, our trauma. So I was a lawyer in South Africa and um, I that I was going to change the world and I was naive and I was going to do all these fantastic things and then I had a practice my practice in fact was um on Grant Avenue in Norwood on a Grant and Orchard Road I think it says Adam Creswick there now so uh, but that's where my law practice was uh, and, and successful for the most part but when we emigrated so we emigrated in 2001 I said to my husband, I'm never going to be a lawyer again. I don't want to be a lawyer. I sold my soul to the devil. And I'm, I, don't want to, I don't want to practice law. And if we go into a new country, I'd rather grill, grill burgers at McDonald's 
than than practice law. I, I don't want, and I'm a vegetarian, so can you imagine that was a that was a, 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 a tough choice that I was making. So um, we emigrated, and within 18 months to two years of being there, I saw there was a glass ceiling. Um, I was never actually going to achieve much because even though I had at South African accreditation and South African degrees and I had all of the South African experience, I didn't have Canadian experience. No one really trusted who I was, what I was, and I couldn't really, I knew that I wasn't going to get higher than the bottom, the highest level of that glass ceiling. So I decided to convert my law degree. Um, I did it with two children under the age of four working full time. And I did it in 18 months um, because law was in my blood. But what I made a strong commitment to myself was that I was going to reclaim my soul back. And I was going to practice law the way that I wanted to practice law because I was so tired of being told how I was expected to show up as a lawyer. And that was not how I wanted to show up. I wanted to show up with my own essence and my own being and my own authenticity. And I was being told that I couldn't. And particularly, I worked for um, a law firm in Canada where I was doing my articles with this man. It's a boutique law firm, but a very prestigious boutique law firm. And he's, in fact, his logo of Vox and Plus. And his logo is, I'll fight for your rights. And I felt like a, a square in a round pigeonhole. It just never sat well with me that this was how, I, and it's, I, I can't speak for South African family law now, uh, but when I was, uh, it wasn't as vicious as it was in Canada. Family law is vicious and it's a cutthroat. And I couldn't be that lawyer that they wanted me to be. So I knew um, I remained five minutes. Oh my God, that's why, no, it's two minutes, okay. <laughs> So but let's, let's just cut all of that out. Let's just go what I do now. Um, I am a non-practicing lawyer now. I actually closed my practice down December 31st, 2021. And this year I actually became um, a, I was a transformational lawyer. That was my branding in 2018 where I took every aspect of myself and I was doing to law. So whoever asked about, are you doing crystals of mindfulness? That was me. I have crystals in my office. I'm a Reiki master and I do mindfulness. So anyone who came into my office, I was sharing all of those tools with them. But it's so important because what law school does for us, it increases our IQ, but it kills off our EQ. So what it does is we say, do not bring emotional intelligence into the law. There's no place for it. Leave the emotions at the door. How can you leave emotions at the door when somebody's life is being impacted and decisions have to be made that are crucial to their life? And so I started bringing emotional intelligence. So I train, I lecture on emotional intelligence. I do conferences on emotional intelligence. And it's so, so when I was a mediator and a lawyer, I brought all of these tools into my retainer agreements. And I would explain to my, my clients, this is what you can expect of me. These are my expectations of you. These are my values. And I'd like to know what your values are so that I can understand who you are when I represent you. But I also did it. I have a whole thing in my retainer agreement that said, when you are at high emotion, your option generation is at low, is at a very, very low level. So when you feel that you're being triggered, these are tools that I want to bring in so that we can actually get your high emotion down to a level so that your prefrontal cortex and your rational brain allows you to start coping and understanding what we're doing in the text. So these things, nine minutes, I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, this is what I do internationally. Um, and one last thing, what I'm loving most about giving these presentations is I don't have the accent. So in all around the world, I'm usually the one with the accent, but you, are, you guys are the ones with the accent. <laughs> so thank you so much. And if you want to know more about what I do, please um, email me or ask me questions. So thank you so much. Next. I'm Tony Zell. I want to start with an expression of gratitude um, all around, but especially Kim. Um, it turns out that my journey, I'm an earth lawyer, um, has required me to become an integrative lawyer as well. Um, I seem to be doing a lot of that work. Uh, unknowingly, and then I met Kim really just uh, within the last year from a student of hers, an Earth Law student of mine, and um, 
Yep, they go hand in hand. My law is more of a substantive practice. It includes rights of nature, rights of future generations, indigenous legality. We saw the picture of the Whanganui River in New Zealand, uh, which has been given living legal personhood, is managed by a guardianship. Um, candidly, it hasn't been great, but the law, the framework is, is very good. Um, I put together a book called Earth Law, Emerging Ecocentric Law, a guide for practitioners. Um, and much of the earth law practice for me is looking how it is unfolding. Where are our successes? Where are our failures? Why were there failures? In Chile recently, uh, we were part of work, we the Earth Law Center, to incorporate rights of nature in their constitution. They're in constitutional convention now, and it didn't work out. Uh, and it really was the same old story that development is more important at this point than undevelopment, than reeling it back. Kim mentioned that I was going to tell a story. And, you know, Earth tells us stories. Earth lawyers tell stories. Um, and it's a story about Cormac Cullinan. And Cormac Cullinan is an environmental lawyer here in South Africa, in Cape Town. He was involved in drafting the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, um, the Ecuadorian Constitution. And he wrote this book called Wild Law. Read it. Um, it changed my life. And here's how. Um, I came here really to go on safari and, and explore some culture in Cape Town. And I bought the book to read on the airplane. And the book talks about Earth jurisprudence. And then the, work, the book talks about the 10 principles of Earth jurisprudence, of which gratitude is very important, and reciprocity, and um, do unto others. These are fundamental principles of jurisprudence that we learn from the Earth. And what the Earth also teaches us, and this is as important as anything that comes to my mind right now, is how to imagine. Because Earth imagines, she unfolds, she, whether it's consciously or not, evolves constantly and rectifies and reforms and changes through imagination, or that's my definition of imagination. And I ask you, as lawyers, can you imagine the lawyer you want to be? And think now, who teaches you, me? Who teaches all beings, all beings, uh, lions and rivers and ecosystems and the porpoises? Who teaches them how to be what they want to be? That's mother, that's earth, that's Pachamama. And earth lawyers, they're already, well, I, I like to put it this way. I've been a lawyer for 36 years. I've been an earthling for 62, combined experience as an earth lawyer, 96 years. Um, I, I want to share a story about Cormac's work. Um, I spent some time in Cape Town in court uh, in a matter. It's river bend litigation. It involves the um, development of a uh, very large uh, commercial development, which will be the Amazon's headquarters in the Republic, in, in Africa. Um, huge facility, shocker, confluence of rivers, sacred land. The Koi, the San, so many peoples have come to that confluence who among themselves have conflicts, but together have only the interests of cultural heritage in mind. It's constitutionally enshrined in this country. It's protected by administrative procedures and national legislation to incorporate the voice of the voices. And the hearing was focused on the violation of an order issued by a high court justice which it was an injunction demanding, requiring, legally requiring cessation of all work, all development work. And it was not complied with. And when law is not complied with, what is there? 
there's enforcement bodies, but think of the courage it might take for a judge to enforce an order by going to enforcement bodies and telling them, bring out the guns, stop those trucks. Is that the right way to solve this problem? Well, it would take an awfully courageous judge to go there for sure. So this ignored order is contempt, of course, and a motion is brought for contempt. And my friend Cormac, representing the uh, Khoisan and this group of indigenous parties, um, is also the subject of a motion, two minutes. And this motion is to disqualify him because his client, Tariq Jenkins is the man's name, is not the authorized representative of the court or the son or anyone else. And what I witnessed was and I find it, I'll use this word, I know it's being recorded, but it's farcical for men to dress up in robes just to comply with this form with the Javits to argue. And what they do is the same thing lawyers do in the United States, the same thing I did pretty well, bloviate, just argue for the sake of argument. And the constitutional issues were never reached. The evidence, that is really uh, a subjective view, um, insurmountable, even the expert witnesses for the developers can see the impact, negative impact on the environment as well as the cultural heritage. Um, but what I saw was that despite having the protections in the constitution, our procedures, our judicial procedures get in the way, broaden that legal systems Get in the way. And I'll conclude with this. And you've heard Kim speak and Nicole, and you'll hear I'm blanking on your name. <laughs> speak about this internal development as an integrative lawyer. I call that conscious altering. As an, a lawyer, as a human being, we alter our consciousness. And then what we see is systemic change. And systemic change can only occur if we change our consciousness and perceive the law as a tool it can be, imagine ourselves as tools in that system to fix the things that we want to fix. So if you're interested in becoming an earth lawyer, you know where to find me. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. That was an interesting introduction to what I'm talking about. Because Tony's talking about having a frustration in a system that isn't working. So I've been a lawyer now for over 40 years. I've been a mediator for almost 30 years. And I practice in a large corporate law firm. I practice for boutique law firms. I practice as a solo practitioner. I've had a mediation practice for almost three decades. I currently live in a small bucolic town on the western coast of the United States called Monterey, in California. The Eastwood was mayor of the town. Um, I have this vision of living in a world where conflicts of every kind are routinely resolved peacefully with love, compassion, empathy, kindness, and gratitude for the past. That's the vision I have. I clearly understand. As Tony said, that's not the world we live in. However, if we can keep that vision in mind as we participate in society as attorneys, we can make a difference. Every morning when I get up, I ask myself the same question. Philip, who do you choose to be today? And recently my answer has been more or less the same. Powerful, loving, compassionate, and kind. I choose to be powerful, loving, compassionate, and kind as a husband, as a father, as an attorney, as a mediator, as a citizen of the world. And then I can notice my thoughts, notice what I say, notice what I do. And I can judge those thoughts, those words, and those actions to see whether or not they're congruent with someone who chooses to be powerful, loving, compassionate, and kind. I have this tool, 
I've been sharing with my clients now for almost 20 years that I developed as a way to try to open them to the possibility of being different when they engaged in conflict. As I, as I was introduced, I was told, I, I consider myself to be a transformational lawyer, that, that label that I came up with almost two decades ago, because the intention of my practice for a number of years has been to help my clients to transform their legal problems into opportunities for personal growth and positive change. That takes a holistic approach. That means I have to see my clients as whole human beings, not just a narrow legal problem. Well, how can I do that? How can I help my clients transform their legal problems into opportunities for personal growth and positive change? It has to do with education. In education, the, the root for education is a Latin word that means to draw out. I need to draw out from my clients what is already there. And what's already there is the sense of humanity. I've yet to find a client who disagrees with the idea of love, compassion, empathy, kindness, and gratitude being words that describe principles that guide, guide us or should guide us in our interaction with other human beings and with the planet. So when a client comes to see me and they complain about something not being fair, I stop them. I take a deep breath and I say to them, you know, I've developed this tool. I've been sharing with my clients now for a number of years. You might find it useful. Would you be interested in hearing about it? And if they say yes, I move forward. And I say, I call this tool a simple question in the game of three rules. The question is, do you believe you can change the past? And I wait for that question to sink in. Do you believe you can change the past? It's interesting, over the last 20 years, I've had a really wide variety of responses to that question. But the truth is, ladies and gentlemen, the answer to that question is no. We cannot change the past. I don't have a time machine. You don't have a time machine. No one I know does. So if you agree that you believe that you cannot change the past, then you qualify to play my game. And I call the game the game of three rules because the game only has three rules. Rule number one, choose to believe the past is perfect for only one reason. You can't change it because if it weren't perfect, you'd want to change it. And wanting to do something you cannot do will just drive you crazy. So when you're playing this game, you're playing the game of three rules. That means that every horrible thing that's happened to you in your entire life is absolutely perfect. It's just the rule for a game. Rule number two, you choose to believe. You notice I'm not telling you it's true. But you choose to believe for purposes of playing this game that everyone always does the best he or she possibly can given the resources they believe are available to them. My examples are out of Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Attila the Hun, who's ever made your life miserable, and you. The reason for the first rule, the past is perfect, is so you stop wasting your precious energy in what I call the shoulda, woulda, coulda conversation. Because no matter how much you gnash your teeth, you're not going to change the past. One bit might as well be perfect. The reason for the second rule, well, think about it. If someone did something to you that harmed you, but when they did what they did, they were doing the best they possibly could. My argument is your only legitimate emotional response to that person is one of compassion. And if you made a horrible mistake, and as a result of that horrible mistake, you either harmed yourself or some harmed someone else. But when you did what you did, you were doing the best you possibly could. You should feel compassion for yourself as well. So the reason for the second rule is to give up any attachment you might have to either shame or blame. Just let them be like dry leaves floating down a river out of sight. No longer impact. There's a code in rule number two. Just because someone's doing the best they can doesn't mean it has to work for you. You have the whole right to decide what works for you and what doesn't work for you. So for example, if you're an employer and you have an employee who keeps showing up for late, late for work every day, you can discharge that employee. But you do it through a lens made up of love and compassion and empathy and kindness and gratitude rather than anger, resentment, and fear. You tell your employee, you know, I know you're doing the best you can. However, the way you're showing up in 
my business doesn't work for me, I think I'd be better off finding alternative employment. The anger and the resentment and the judging isn't there. Now I told you that there were that there were three rules to the game, and I've got two more minutes. I can get through to all three of them. <laughs> um, the third rule is once again you choose to believe, for purposes of playing this game, that you alone on this planet are 100% responsible for your current situation and for changing it if you choose to do so. Now, 50%, 95%, of 100%. That's the entire game. The past is perfect. Everyone does the best they can. And I'm 100% responsible for my current situation and for changing it if I choose to do so. I then ask my clients to take their legal problem and to bring it into the game. And I ask them if it feels any different. And they always say yes. They're now focusing their energy on the only thing they have control over. Problem in front of them now. I believe that there are only three things that I have control over. The thoughts I choose to believe are true, the words I choose to speak, and the action I choose to take. And to the extent that I focus my energy on anything other than that, in my estimation, it's a waste of my energy. I focus, I have a mentor, Jack Canfield, who taught me a formula a number of years ago. E plus R equals O. E stands for the events in our lives. Plus R, how we choose to respond to those events, generates the O, the outcome. We often do not have control over the events in our lives, but we always, if we choose to do so, have control over how we choose to respond to those events. And when we change the response, we change the outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think just a, a few comments on that uh, and, and some reflections is, you know, we've got a, a very set way of thinking how law must be practiced. And, and what I'm hearing is that it's a time of healing for the trauma, the collective trauma we've experienced, not just in war, but also in terms of our clients. So, so thank you for that. Um, I would like to, again, just thank our speakers and for everyone that has joined, I uh, appreciate that. And I think there's been some insights in, in terms of this emerging area of the law. Um, I'd like to uh, invite also everyone that has attended here physically just for some refreshments and you can perhaps uh, engage with our speakers for some more questions uh, and, and uh, an opportunity for, for further discourse. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Bye, Danke. Yeah, well. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. And on online. Yeah, in your course. Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, am I, am I audible? Yes. Am I am I audible? Am I, am I coming through? We can hear you. Please go ahead. Well, I had a question for the previous speaker, the one before you, but uh, since you're not here, since he's... Uh, for for, for um... Yes, go ahead. Oh, sir. Uh, uh, good. I... <clears throat> uh, it's nice to see you. I wanted to. I wanted to ask that you said that I, I can understand where the the encouragement of saying that we're a hundred percent responsible for 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 what happens, and and, and all of that. But uh, well, actually, that's not what I said. What I said is I'm a hundred percent responsible for my current situation. And what happened is part of the oh, past. Yes. The past is perfect simply because it's the past. It, yes. I, I, I confess that it's a bit of an intellectual game. However, it has many uses in my estimation. Go ahead. Oh, so, so, you, you, so, so you're not implying that everything is within our control, basically. 
oh no, what is, what's, in, what's in my control is how I respond to what is. If you get back to that formula, E plus R equals O, as I indicated, E are the events in our lives. We typically do not have control over those. I don't have control over the events in my life. However, I do have control over how I choose to respond to those events. And it's a distinction that I believe is really important to understand that I do have control over how I respond. I don't have control over whether it's raining today. I don't have control over whether the train arrives on time, but I oh, do have, for example, I yesterday, yesterday I, I took an Uber to the wrong campus. Um, and, I, and when I arrived at the wrong campus and went to the room where I thought the lecture was, there was no one there. And I didn't have control over that, but I did have control over how I chose to respond to that, which was to ask someone for directions to the right campus and to, and to ask and, and to get a second Uber and to go there with as much diligence as I could. So it's, it's a mindset. I, I think what's, what I find helpful to me and to my clients is to adopt what I refer to as a growth mindset. When I say a growth mindset, it, it means I'm open and curious to learning new ways of thinking, new ways of being, and that just because a solution that I had in the future worked for me then doesn't necessarily it's going to work for, for me in the future. So there's a certain agility of thought that comes from choosing to stay curious and to, and to see events in our lives as opportunities for personal growth and positive change. If you recall, my purpose is to help my clients to transform their legal problems into opportunities for personal growth and positive change. Most people don't think of legal problems as a gift. Mm -hmm. My invitation is to invite my, my invitation to my clients is to ask them to consider that legal problem as a gift and to become curious as to what that gift will produce, to become curious as to the benefit that will come from whatever has happened to them. And it's, it's a mindset. It, it's an attitude, if you like. I was having a conversation with a young lady last week. We were on safari and there was this lion very close to us and she was very, very scared. And I, and I chatted to her, I put my arm around her. I said to her, you know, dear, the, you know what the difference is between fear and excitement? And she said, no, it's an attitude. That your body's generating the same hormones when you're fearful or when you're excited, but the distinction is a small degree of separation. I choose to be excited rather than fearful. And I think the difference between being fearful and excited is also when I'm excited, I'm curious as to what's going to happen next. When I'm fearful, I dread what's going to happen. And what's happening outside of me hasn't changed. The only difference is how I am responding to that stimulus. I'm, I'm, I'm creating that gap between stimulus and response where choice lies. I'm married to this amazing woman. Um, <coughs> we've been married now for 30, almost 35 years. And when I first met her, she was 22 and I was 33 years old. And she said to me, Philip, I choose to believe that the lives we live are the results of the choices we make. I choose to believe the lives we live are the results of the choices we make. And that belief I took on as my own, and it's been my own for three and a half decades. It's not the truth, but it serves me. If I choose to believe that my life is a result of my choices, there is no space for me to be a victim. I am cause in my life. And whatever the E is, whatever the event is in my life, it doesn't matter. At that moment that that event presents itself, I can choose to respond. And what I've decided is L-C-E-K-G. L-C-E-K-G. I'm going to respond looking at that event through a lens made up of love and compassion and empathy and kindness and gratitude. And all of that's made up. I chose those words. I put them together. It's all made up. It's not true. However, by viewing these events through that lens of love and compassion and empathy and kindness and gratitude, I transform that E into a different O. 
and it works for me. And by sharing that with my clients over the years, it has worked for them. I believe we as lawyers have a fiduciary duty to our clients to put their interests before our own. And if I am aware of a way of being that most people don't know about, but I have the experience that being that way has helped me live a, a more fulfilled, more joyous life, then I believe I have a fiduciary duty to my clients to share that way of being. So if they choose to do so, they can choose to be that way as well. I can't force them to do that. As I said before, when I stood here, there are only three things I have control over. The thoughts I choose to believe are true, the words I choose to speak, and the action I choose to take. Nothing you say, nothing you think, nothing you do, do I have control over. I'm not going to focus on what I don't have control over. I have control over my mind. Viktor Frankl is one of my heroes. If you haven't heard about him, he was this psychiatrist who, who was in a concentration camp in the Second World War. And he understood that he had no control over the E, but he had control over the R. And in doing so, he generated a different vote. All right. Um, uh, yes, I still have a question. I wasn't allowed to pause it. Um, so now that you've clarified uh, what you were basically saying with regards to, to that, let's get past it. Okay. <laughs> to ask what is the difference between the concept of ethic in the law with the, con with the concept of emotional intelligence, as was discussed? I just want clarification in that in that area. Well, I, th I think ethics in the law and emotional intelligence work hand in glove, but they're not the same thing. I believe that emotional intelligence makes it easier for you to behave in an ethical way because emotional intelligence includes the concept of empathy. And I think in order to be truly ethical, one needs to, one needs to respond toward others from a space of love compassion, empathy, kindness, and gratitude. And that if one judges one's thoughts and one's words and one's actions through that filter, then you have your North Star. Integrated lawyers tend to be value-based lawyers. Everyone gets to choose what their values are. I've chosen my LCEKG. You get to choose whatever you want. LCEKG works for me. I'm not going to force anyone else to adopt LCEKG. However, it works for me. You get to decide what your core values are. Every culture has a commonality with every other culture, and every culture has differences. In, in South Africa, we have Wudu. That's not a native thing in North America. However, it's a wonderful, wonderful concept. And that becomes part of your culture, part of who you are, part of your values. However, we all can choose values that are love-based as opposed to fear-based. And I have chosen to operate my law practice from a love-based perspective as opposed to a fear-based perspective. And I can tell you, after practicing law for over 40 years, it's worked really well for my clients, and I've made a good living. Some really good questions you asked between uh, what is the difference between ethics and emotional intelligence. Uh, so you can behave ethically within the law, but that doesn't mean it's morally correct. So, for example, apartheid. You people had to walk around with houses and were thrown out of houses and lived in townships with all of this. Because the law said that was ethical. The law said what you were doing was within a legal framework that was ethical and correct because that's what the law said. Emotional intelligence says that's not right. Emotional intelligence says there is something morally corrupt. What the law is saying is that. And if I, if, if my moral compass and my integrity is who I be, then I have to be an internal activist in myself to say that is not correct. And once my, my moral compass and my internal activism says 
that's not correct. You then go outside to become a public activist. That says, even though what you're doing is correct and ethical within the law, morally, it's not correct. And many, many things in the law are ethically correct, but morally corrupt. And emotional intelligence says, know the difference, and then shine and be the difference. So I, I don't know if that answers the question. Colleagues, students, I know there's a lot more that we can talk about, and there's probably a lot more conversation. But let's do this maybe off, offline and, and continue the discussion with your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.